we're going to spend some time setting this up, hopefully around 20 seconds, and then we will start. So I'm super happy to be here. Um, the reason being, the conference is, the title starts with computational design. So, <laughs> yes, exactly. So the funny thing is, the, 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 my colleague, uh, uh, whoop, let me start this. It's kind of like giving me a lot of energy is, has been in it for a long time too. So I came to, I stepped on the US soil 20 years ago to do my degree in uh, master's degree at MIT in computational design. And for two decades, my affiliations and jobs have been about explaining what computational design is. And on the side, I also tried to do you know, some projects. Uh, as, as we were discussing, discussing with Duan for this conference, um, you know, I, was, I didn't know that I was gonna go first, but I submitted the title, Design Computation Human. And then, you know, I tried to kind of like bring computation back to being human and, uh, you know, reveal what computers cannot do as a computational designer so I can use my computational strengths to do the best I can. So that's my approach. It's slightly different. Sometimes it causes troubles for me, but, you know, I go with that. So uh, my question when I came to MIT was, okay, how can a computer render this, right? So that was my question. Computational aesthetics, uh, I like the image, but can I teach the computer to render that? Uh, so today, I just, you know, type it. This is a, you know, uh, AI-generated image. So you just give the prompt, it creates it for you. But if you go back 19 years, that was kind of like rough, and I didn't know much about it. I'm an architect, by the way. I'm an architect, I'm not a programmer. So what I was going to say, you know, there's a meaning that you can understand. You understand in products, in, you know, vision, but also there's the information that I have to kind of like deal with all the time, right? So if I have to quantify anything, I have to go into it. Look at it, understand it, and then you know subdivide it into like little components, and then so you can combine them back and make something out of it. Actually, help the machine make something out of that. Unlike me, because I don't, I don't have to kind of like subdivide the world into pieces while I'm looking at it. I understand there's a room here, I see you, and so on and so forth. So there's a really great article about it, uh, this subject of meaning and information by David Bohm. Uh, if you're interested, just check that out. David Bohm is a uh, you know, um, famous uh, physicist who passed away quite a while ago. Um, so what I did was, at the time, I'm like, okay, let me take this picture. So I, I heard about this thing, which is called gray levels, right? So you can do some bitmap processing. And I was like, okay, I can, I can try that. Uh, let, let, let me learn a little bit of like programming for that. So I thought myself, um, programming in Max, 3D Max, Max script. And I started analyzing the images in 3D Max, right? So I was plotting the, uh, let's say, I was segregating the darks and brighter pixels. I was trying to also look uh, into composition uh, of the images. And then I was trying to do some like edge detection, which I learned from, you know, a, a friend at electronics department. I was like, okay. To, to detect objects in the scene. So he was like, okay, there's this algorithm which you know, helps you uh, differentiate between the, uh, determine the shorelines you know, as you're kind of like uh, from the satellite's pictures. So I was like, okay, let me try that. And then I made another algorithm. I made it up, you know, I was like, okay, if I go from left to right, how much the grays are changing, like brightness is changing from left to right, and I plotted them. I combined the three you know, uh, algorithms. I set some scores, I sorted them. I let, the, I let the computer render images. They were like 32 pixels to 16 pixels overnight, okay? And the next day I went and, you know, found the selected images and re-rendered them in a large format. And then I prepared this UI, you know, to let's say set your rules for rendering and so on and so forth. And then I realized, wow, that was a thesis on computational aesthetics that I did. I had no idea. And I also didn't know that it was about machine learning because it was Im image processing, feature detection, segmentation, fitness scoring, and so on and so forth, right? So, so then I started seeing these people like uh, AI experts, uh, you know, image uh, en prompt engineers, uh, kind of coming forward and front and, you know, talking about, yeah, Mid Journey is amazing. And so I was like, okay, well, maybe, maybe I have to think about it a little more. Uh, so I have this 10 years between my um, master's thesis and the PhD thesis. So in between, I got really intrigued about like what computers cannot do, as I was explaining. And I went back to MIT and I was like, okay, I'm gonna do a super blind system. I don't want the computer to be smart. I just want it to help me replicate myself. And I, 
I start drawing this on diagram. So if you look at that on diagram, which is kind of like open, you can, it's not like a flow chart because I had problems with like inputs and outputs. I, in my mind, everything was flying in the air. So I was trying to represent that. So what's happening here is that there's a transparent surface. You make watercolor drawings and then you can actually um, capture whatever you draw and then you can project back to your drawing underneath and then you can trace your own you know trace so like tracing your own trace so and i can talk about it in mathematical terms so if you look at the schemas at the bottom you see x goes to t of x so something is being trans you know translated uh, and on the surface zero goes to x is like nothing goes to something and you can get what is interesting in this kind of computation is that it's open-ended because you end up like creating some weird stuff, let's say the red circles, which weren't inherent in the system. It was, they weren't there, right? So the human perception is interesting in the way that you can just kind of like make things up, right? Uh, but it, unlike a data set, uh, we will discuss about that later. But at the same time, I was super interested in like, like keeping the, um, the material qualities, the, the things we touch, the th things we interact with, right? So painting is really important in that, in that aspect. Like as a designer, as an architect, as a kind of like, uh, you know, hobbyist painter, I was really interested in not being able to touch the stuff that I was designing all the time. But also like, you know, uh, I think my point was, okay, these things don't have to be that far apart. If you know about shape grammars, actually you can make these kind of visual computing and then translation of X, X goes to X plus part of X and so on. So the difference here is that I'm not multiplying or adding up numbers like one, two, three, right, which are super abstract. I have shapes and shapes are my uh, units and a shape doesn't have a definition. It's just a weird stroke and it doesn't have to be definitive so it can change over time. So it's a pretty interesting way to compute actually. So if you want to kind of learn about it, you can read about this book, which is What Computers Still Cannot Do, which was published in, I think, like 80s or 90s. Uh, so this is already like three decades old, and there's the first version of this book, which is quite interesting. So I finished the PhD. I got, you know, I'm like, okay, you know, I'm still having this ambivalent feeling against computers. By the way, I'm really using them, right? So I don't have anything against computers. <laughs> I, I love it. I'm a computational designer. I make my life with it. I sleep with it. I wake up with it, and so on and so forth. But you know, I started doing these oil paintings and you know, taking the pictures of them. That's exactly when uh, the style again started emerging, right? So people were kind of like collecting these data sets. For me, it was a retrospective thing because I had the data set already. It was my interest that kind of like captures this picture and just, just put them together. And then I trained a you know, custom model on this and I got, got these images which were, okay, I'm like, interesting, but what are they? They are not exactly my paintings. And it was interesting to see the, um, the reflection of the, you know, the patterns from the paintings, but at the same time, the patterns from the photography. Like you, you can see depth of field, you know, light blurs, and you know, uh, also those kind of like visual qualities in these images. So then I did this. Uh, there's, there's sound, if, I don't know if you can play it, but not a big deal. Okay, so. It's fine. Anyway, so you know, there's, there's music. It's, it's not a big deal. What's happening is that's the latent space of paintings uh, that are trained by, you know, like the ML uh, machine, machine learning, the train model. And then I took them and I explored them in space and then I added these like tectonic levels, you know, because I'm an architect and lost painter and then, you know, I'm designing shoes at the same time. So this was a kind of like confusing to me. But I like playing and I was like, okay, what am I doing really? People ask me when I show these, they're like, what is the purpose of this? Like, why do you do that, right? So I was like, okay, I was just cloud gazing, right? Like looking at the clouds and trying to see shapes. And it, this kind of like connects with, you know, uh, so Solnit says, okay, you know, why am I doing this? So you need some sort of something to be efficient, purposeful and utilitarian in the modern world. And if it doesn't work, if you cannot measure it, there's no meaning into it, right? So like that's, how can we kind of like get away from that? Because I benefited actually from these kind of like cloud gazing stuff a lot. So anyway, that was the critique I think of the, of the book and I kind of like brought it back here. And then uh, of course this kind of like play, do we do that uh, at work? Of course we do. Uh, and again, more than three years ago, 
uh, we looked into you know some uh, SGAN models and we were like style GAN models and we were like okay what if we trained something on speed that would inspire designers to to use these things for uh, you know making sketches and you know uh, and creating concepts and I wanted to move forward like push it forward a little more than that and uh, you know recruited some of my friends and said hey are you are you on board to create something that we can we can showcase we can kind of like demonstrate in the company that's that's my take usually I you know when we come up with ideas I have to do the um, proof of concept and just push push for those things uh, so you know this is I haven't seen this in person because I was away. Still, I haven't seen it. I, I'm back to US. But this was 3D printed. Uh, you know, somebody, I, I really don't remember who did it actually, you know, put this sock like an upper in it and then sent the picture, photographed him. And I'm like, oh, okay. Like, it, this is really doable. Uh, can you wear it? Yes. Can you run it? No, because it's not the right material to do that, right? So it's just visual. Uh, but it's okay to make these kind of like, you know, again, like cloud, um, cloud gazing kind of stuff. So these are, uh, some crops from the concepts that we built on the office. So just to show that, okay, we can push the digital stuff like crazy, right? And <laughs> especially if you're not manufacturing or printing them, right? So there's, there's, there are no limits. So on the mathematical side, on the formula side, we, we show that. Uh, well, is that useful? Actually, turn on the focus class in uh, 2028 MIT, which was bringing this, you know, like super crazy concepts and the knowledge that we developed at, at, at New Balance by uh, 3D printing. I'm gonna give a break here and um, I, actually, I, this event is great. <laughs> this is the second note about it. One was computational design. The other one is, I already met some people that I have met digitally, uh, but I've never seen them physically, right? So I saw those people. And then I also had friends who were, you know, that I haven't seen for like uh, 15, 20 years. They are here too. And then, this class actually became you know, a conversation, online conversation with some people, and I saw some of them here too. So with that again, like thank you for you know, like, uh, letting me talk about uh, this, this material today. So <clears throat> if we go back and like, okay, we have the crazy digital stuff, we have the uh, manufacturing, so how do we kind of like combine these things and you know, um, design is about kind of coming up with the problems that we can really restrict and answer, find answers for. So motorcycle riding is an interesting thing. You know, it has nothing to do with like bicycle riding or driving, uh, if you ask me. And then your body position counts a lot because similar to any sports you do, right? So your, your kind of ergonomics are really important because you can do something wrong and things can go really wrong. Or Oh, the, the, the thing, the material itself is designed for a specific per, uh, purpose. So if you want to go fast, it looks different. The, the way you hold the handlebars, where you put the, where the pegs are, how you sit, you know. And you see some people kind of like going like this on the road, right? So uh, just kind of like borrowing that idea as we were getting uh, ready for this conference, you know, I asked in the group, um, can we do something similar for running to explain it to people? Because... You know, I learned, that when I started working for New Balance, I knew nothing about shoes, except wearing them. I can do my laces too. Uh, but then I said, okay, what if, we, what if we explain the, you know, the economics in terms of like uh, cushioning, you know, which changes tremendously uh, depending on the activity, the drop that you have in the shoes, and put all those together to show that, okay, it's really kind of like the motorcycle design, you know, where things go is changing depending on the, uh, the purpose. But at the same time, just to represent that it's so hard to design shoes, like how can you, because shoes are made by using lasts, which is the internal mold, right, you build around. So you're seeing the section of the, you know, the, um, the last, but you see the foot, the foot has not, I mean, there are correlations, connections between the foot last and the shoe. But I mean, computationally, it's, I would say almost impossible to define, right? So there's a guy who knows last and he, he takes it and he's like, he, he does this and he's like, oh, I have to shave it a little bit here. That's it. That's his knowledge and I don't know how that information will be kind of transferred to the next generation of last makers. So that's designing for, right? And then we design with. So this is an interesting subject because data, you know, it, it, it has been hot. Uh, it's super hot now uh, because of 3D printing, AI, and so on. So data is an interesting thing. So here is data, for instance, by uh, an interpretation of data by Tim Noll. So he, 
Tim knows uh, he's kind of like attaching um, these pens to trees and the, the wind is blowing. So the tree is plotting something, making art, right? But at the same time, it's the data that's representing the st stiffness of the branch and then, you know, um, the, the, you know the, the, the magnitude of the wind and, and so on and so forth, right? So depending on that, actually, that data is something that we make. Right? So I can say, hey, data is exactly the thing that is found under your feet as you're walking or running. So I can just say that, right? So you can, you can say, okay, data is this, this, data is that. And then uh, where it comes from is actually, it comes from wherever you look at for finding it, okay? So as an architect, we looked on the surface of buildings for making solar simulations or to make the, you know, structural analysis of the buildings to, to look for that. So data is exactly at the location that you're looking at. So here is an insert, pressure insert, that you put uh, in your shoe. And once you start running, uh, let's say we can measure the, you know, the, the event, the pressure event that happens as you're running from the kind of like landing and takeoff. And now what you do is, okay, there are numbers. Let's split them. You know, let's record these numbers. Let's parse them. Let's write a code. Now let's just make sure that our structure looks good. Let's make sure it, it's uh, connected. It doesn't break apart. Let's make sure it's kind of carrying. It's doing what it's supposed to do. Let's explore some different options. Let's look at the you know softer ones, harder ones, and then let's uh, print them. Uh, so I, we can have a better understanding. Because if you stay in the digital, well, it's not tangible. If you're wearing something, you have to feel it. If you are feeling something, you know, it has to be sturdy and it has to have a life, lifetime lifespan and it has to perform. So we ended up doing maybe 1,400 parts so far. Um, uh, but for a specific study for these shoes, triple cell technology, we called it, uh, we created two shoes. One had this forefoot part, the other one had a heel part. It was a really interesting process of kind of like creating, learning, designing. Uh, and the goal was, okay, you know, let's design these two shoes, which are by using the same material, which are behaving significantly different than each other. And let's put these parts in different locations in the shoe. One is a forefoot part, the other one is a heel part. And then let's, let's show that, okay, we can customize things if needed and uh, by using the same material. So that's, that's a learning from design for additive manufacturing, right? So I'm taking you from computational aesthetics to drawing to paintings to building making, which I didn't show, and then to DFAM. So what's happening in DFAM is uh, there's a big shift in, you know, parts are changing, processes, methods, and tests are all changing. And this is just to acknowledge that, okay, the material is the same, but you can do um, a lot by using the same material and the same process and make the thing perform really differently. And this also being in footwear business, so what I learned a lot is actually footwear design empowered me to use the claim. So I always said, okay, simulation is not reality. It's not gonna work. I always give the example of Bank of America building in Manhattan by, you know, like Times Square, which was, which, which was a you know, lead platinum building. There's an article about it, you, can, you should read it. Simulations were a huge percentage off. What is important here is that uh, what you see on the 997 shoe, uh, the colorful one, you see ANCAP reveal. So there are nested components in there, let's say five, six parts, you know, nested together, which are you know, together doing something for the shoe to perform, whereas in the black one, you have one single part, which is by lattice design, doing all those things together, no nesting, nothing, you just print it and it works. Uh, this is also bringing the, the notion of how we understand the world, right? So you can represent and describe a shoe in very different ways. In my mind, it's always this like blue, yellow, you know, green thing, because it's like very mushy. That's, that's how I feel with my, you know, feet in it. So like all the other representations are not that, that uh, accurate. But also the parts are, you know, by nature, they are just scientifically put there because, again, it's like data because we want to understand and talk about it. Can anybody tell where your finger ends and your palm starts? Well, there's a line there, but it's not, I mean, if you scale in, there's no line, actually. Everything is connected, right? Same thing for trees. We cannot talk about trees, so we have to kind of like subdivide it into pieces. Same for engines, right? So here are different piston representations for you. They are like totally different. Uh, depending on what you're trying to say about engines and pistons, because it can also become an artwork, right? So this is a, there are lots of pistons there, 
and they are just being used for the sake of making an artwork. Okay, so this is a scientific method, pretty much. Uh, you, our assignment is for, for science, for building, is to go to the you know, landscape, go to the beach, and then we are asked to take a handful of grains and we need to sort them into part, like categories, right? So as we start categorizing parts right, with our scientific knife, right, we split everything into, uh, let's say, buckets, depending on the color, size, translucency, transparency, and so on. But then you pick a grain and then it doesn't fit into any of these clusters. What do you need to do? You either need to go back and change your classification or you need to kind of like cheat a little bit and just kind of, you know, ignore the, <laughs> that, that grain. So this is from uh, the book that you have just seen. It's from the Zen and the uh, Art of Motorcycle Maintenance by Robert Persick, talking about the um, scientific method. Okay, we're coming to the end. Okay, what do we learn uh, by working with computers? One, ambiguity is really important. So if I ask you if the point is inside or outside in the condition A or B, you would say, like that. You know which one is inside, which one is outside. You're counting the number of intersections. So you would see that if the number of intersections is odd, the point is inside. If it is even, it's outside. Beautiful. We took something perceptual and solved it computationally, but the problem is we lost the curves, right? So look, we, we lost the vision. That's very important. When we say, for instance, co uh, computer vision, it's or Artificial intelligence, it has the vision, but the vision is super different than ours. Same thing for artificial intelligence, which is like totally different than our understanding and learning processes. So for design, you also have to come up with this binary things work for a while until you find the crocodile, which is, you know, like super important to say. Uh, beyond the duck and rabbit, you have to search for this to add real value. And speaking about values, it's really important because you know, this is from uh, Albert Durer from 1514. So he said, what is beautiful? I do not know. In the picture, you see tools of computation and measurement, you know, like pretty like the hourglass and the compass and the, you know, like the hammer. So today we are like, okay, what can I do with ChatGPT and Midjourney today? I don't know, before I go to bed. So you, you are kind of like constantly being bombarded with these tools, but you know, where's the meaning in using those? So you have to be critical to find that. I took this class uh, from uh, Patrick Winston at MIT, and I happened to, as a designer, read all the papers from like 1952 till our day on uh, seminal papers on AI, which helped me a lot to understand how AI works, uh, which is also helping me uh, you know, comment on AI and so on. But beyond it, I think collaboration is really important. We are really at the end here. So I have uh, the New Balance design team with me uh, at this conference because we said, okay, we're gonna go and learn a lot uh, in the conference. So these are actually combining all this knowledge of like sculpting, uh, but at the same time, you know, bringing data, bringing, uh, let's say, performance uh, to, to shoe making. Uh, this is all done by the computational design team at work. But then also uh, what we do is to, to kind of like connect everything. Uh, we are like, okay, let's, let's bring the new tools. You know, we have the data, we have machine learning, let's, let's be inspirational, we are designers, let's keep everything, and then, uh, you know, do something with it, and again, like, put the proof of concept on the table. So this is pretty much that, and I said, okay, it was a month ago, this is the end, thank you very much, a month ago, uh, you know, I said, okay, why are we trying to constantly make shoes by knitting? Because, you know, the patterns are so interesting, and they are, shoes are too small. So I said, make a sweatshirt. Sweater. And I said, if you make it, I'm going to wear it. So now I have to fulfill, fulfill my promise right here. So this is the first data-driven, machine learning made okay, all right, sweatshirt. That was done actually one day before, completed one day before we draw here as a team. So I would like to thank the computational design team at New Balance. They will be around uh, in this event. Uh, but we are missing our NIT expert uh, who is in another team. Uh, to combine everything. But again, yeah, we just kind of like create stuff and put it on the table to see if there's any value or not. Thank you.